Hi, everybody. I'm Yvonne Lee. I'm the community manager here at DICE. And today we have a really fascinating topic. To present it, we have our Linux community guide, Rob Riley. Okay, and we also have a guest, uh, Bill Weinberg, who is uh, an analyst both at Linux Pundit and at Black Duck, where he's also the director and practice manager. Hi, guys. Hi, Vaughn. Hi, Vaughn. So we're talking today about something that's supposedly really going to be big next year, which is the Internet of Things. What exactly is that, Rob? Uh, it, it covers a lot of different areas. Um, most people think of it as a little sensor on a little board somewhere that's hooked up to the Internet, and then it sends data uh, or receives data uh, to a, a server or um, another machine or whatever. And it's a, a physical connection to the real world. The Internet of Things is a logical consequence of evolution that's been happening in embedded systems development over the last decade. And embedded systems basically say you take a microprocessor or other kinds of computer intelligence and you put them in things like printers, cars, microwave ovens, uh, weapon systems, industrial control. There's six or eight vertical segments that we generally address when we talk about embedded systems or intelligent devices. Now, you know, go back a decade or so, and these were not connected to each other or barely connected to each other. They were standalone devices. We used to joke about them prototypically being toasters. They did one thing reasonably well and they dissipated heat. Once you put networking on these devices and once you put reasonably communicative peer level type operating systems on either the device or on a gateway near the device, they became the peers of all sorts of other device, all sorts of other computers in the world, and it gave rise to the ability of, of all sorts of new kinds of interaction between devices. They were no longer standalone, and just it, it not, it didn't only add the capability to communicate; it redefined the function of those devices. So, what's different about your car is that in the classical mode, if your car puts up a so-called idiot light, or more recently tells you a. a a readable message that was for you the passenger in the car or maybe a diagnostic for the mechanic in the service bay but now the car will send you an email or interact with an application that the manufacturer is running in the cloud to schedule your um, next service and to remind you to go to the service and even have the the dealer prepared to have you come in with the right parts that's cool now that does bring up another uh, important point about evolution. We're talking about going from here to there in, in parts of a year. So there's a certain circle of people who are going to be able to move more easily into working with the Internet of Things. What, what kinds of people, what kinds of workers would those be? Well, I see it, it drawing on a couple sources. If you're a developer who's been working in any kind of embedded systems, intelligent device programming, it's a very logical extension. It depends what part of those devices you've been working on. Classically, they were very unified and everybody was doing the same kind of low-level coding and there was no real distinction between application and device. But with the advent of embedding Linux and Android and a whole bunch of other OSs, you now have the ability to think about applications on an intelligent device like you would on a desktop or a server. So it's opened up the types of developers that could work on intelligent devices and things on the Internet because everyday application developers, you no longer have to be as specialized to work in that domain. So you, someone who would be writing an application on a desktop or on a phone could certainly be transferring that knowledge to writing application, application level code on other types of devices. Now, for very low level, little tiny clients, it still requires a bit of expertise. But uh, I'll let Rob tell you about the IDE he's been using on his Arduino that makes even programming very small and relatively dumb devices a lot more like doing everyday applications programming. Yeah, a lot of our readers and viewers will probably be familiar with the Arduino. It's a small microcontroller. Uh, here's a pic. Here's a uh, uh, an NG, one of the original versions, and then they go all the way down to the Arduino Mini, 
which is this this big, and this is a a complete microcontroller package with I think it's 16 uh, digital inputs and outputs, a couple of analog to digital uh, pins on it, and you can do pulse width map modulation. Everybody or a lot of the readers will know what that is. That's that lets you control LEDs and and things like that. Um, but the idea with this and it has a standardized um, development environment uh, that you use. You download, it works on Linux, Macs, um, Windows, and all of those, and it's a, a very basic um, editor and uh, programming environment. All you do is you write your code, it's similar to C, and you compile it on your notebook, and then you uh, transfer it to the Arduino as firmware. And once it loads up on the Arduino, it resets, and then your whole program on your Arduino starts to run. And all it does is collect, um, it reads the inputs, maybe does some calculations, and then uh, sets some outputs. And you can also communicate over USB and uh, serial lines, so you can get data in and out. And then that opens up all kinds of possibilities because you can hook that up to networking hardware and, um, and XP radios and things of that nature. We're talking about what's also called ubiquitous computing. So in the case of ubiquitous computing, you have um, computers everywhere doing everything transparently. And uh, it may not be in the shape of a computer. It might be in the shape of a light bulb. It might be in your car. It, it, you, the whole point of embedded or ubiquitous computing is <laughs> for the users, you might not look at an object and know it's computing, that it's connected to the Internet, and even more ubiquitously, you probably don't even know it's there. It blends into the background. And so the Internet of Things is also about creating smarter environments, uh, making the world connected to the Internet by having sensors everywhere, actuators everywhere, um, which, on one hand, is very nice because it means you, we can have smarter homes and smarter cars and, and devices that, you know, use energy more efficiently or generate electricity more efficiently. Uh, on the downside, of course, it, it certainly brings up some risks, uh, the two risks being privacy and security. And we've been thinking a lot about privacy lately, but on the security side, think about the fact that you may be... Um, Expose, on the privacy side, you may be exposing all sorts of data and you have to have a security layer. So a big interest area in Internet of Things is e-health. So instead of having to go to a doctor, go to a clinic, let's say you're having your heart monitored, you would instead hook up a heart monitor to your local network and it would stream data. You either collect data and burst it or possibly actively stream data that your physician could be looking at or it could be collected by an application in the cloud. That's very private information that could be used by insurance companies or used by all sorts of people. So needing, you know, securing it both, you have, you have three places you need to secure it. You need to secure it on the device, you need to secure it in transit, and you need to secure it at rest after transit, you know, in the cloud, in a data center, wherever it is. Um, similarly, you have security concerns on the outbound side. So it's not just about getting data in, but putting data out. So if, um, let's say part of your Internet of Things paradigm is that the doors on your house are controlled via the Internet so you can lock them and unlock them. Well, you wouldn't want someone getting into your network and unlocking your house and getting, you know, inviting thieves in or any number of potential risks like that. Or if you had a defibrillator attached to the oh Internet, you wouldn't want somebody <laughs> stopping your heart, you know? So it, it, gets, it has some interesting entailments for privacy and security. Um, and the two are very, as you see, very closely interwoven. I'd also like to add too uh, the device that I showed you earlier. That's a, that's a like you might even think of that as a first generation Internet of Things device because it's very tied to the hardware, and you don't have a lot of um, computing power in that little device. Now, in the last uh, six months or so, there's uh, a, a couple of new devices have shown up that actually are running a version of Linux. And um, uh, the Raspberry Pi is kind of an example of that. It's a, a smaller footprint, and it has a, a, a very capable version of Linux running on it, which, by extension, 
gives you the capability to take care of some of these security issues. And that's just developed in the last six months or a year or so. So in, before we wrap up, I, I would like to talk a little bit about the skills, bring it back to the majority of our readers who are trying to advance their careers. So um, it sounds like some of the main uh, skills that people will need to move into this area are, it sounds like Linux administrations, but I'm not sure about that one, the cloud and and uh, embedded systems programs. Are there any other skills that you think would be useful? I would personally emphasize developer skills. I mean, administrative skills are a given, but the interesting opportunities will come from uh, point no development and end-to-end -end application development. And, and of course, each of those will have different sub-skills in them. So certainly the emerging cloud um, skill set in the market is very important because this data will be received and, and crunched in the cloud. And in fact, let's extend that definition to include big data because uh, the Internet of Things is one of the most important input domains for big data. Uh, mobile, industrial, uh, all of these other domains we've been talking about, e-health, they're all input domains for, you know, gathering all sorts of big data in, into cloud apps or maybe into data centers. So it's um, once that data is collected, once it's ingested, gone through some ETL regime, um, it's just like any other kind of data in a data center. It's not unique in it being Internet of Things data. Um, when you move down this, uh, this tree towards the terminal nodes, the skills are much more about embedded systems development. Rob, are there any other skills that you think would be useful for uh, people wanting to move into this area? Yeah, I've written several articles, uh, you know, for DICE, um, spelling out some of the things that I think will be hot uh, as far as skills go. Um, when, when you talk, start talking about the Arduino and, and embedded Linux systems and so on, uh, we, we really can't forget about having some idea of how the the stuff hooks up to the physical world um, how you know uh, now you might look and say a developer may not need to know how an electric motor gets turned on but in my opinion I really think you should at least have some, some basic knowledge because um, as we move away from just the applications and web interaction and start to to you know, actually do things in the physical world, being able to actually know what's going to happen out there, uh, I think is going to be important. And you're, you're going to, I mean, some of these electronics will need to hook up to hydraulic systems, the larger electrical uh, uh, power handling systems. And it, and it seems to me like there's been a, there's going to be a pretty big jump between the microcontroller and to some of these big, heavy physical systems. And of course, electrical engineers, I think there will be a, a lot of uh, opportunity for them. And, and the person that can step back and look at all of these things connected together, uh, I think that, will, that there will be a lot of opportunity for those kinds of people. Uh, in other words, I think you, you should have a, some knowledge of all the systems, the physical part as well as the programming and the electrical part. Um, the electrical engineering part is important, electrical and mechanical engineering. The closer you get to hardware and the richer the hardware you're controlling or connecting, the greater you know, the risk, the greater the requirement for understanding the physical constraints. Uh, right. If you're controlling a motor, you can burn out the motor or burn out the controller for the motor the, or, for that matter, you know, tear the piece of equipment apart. I used to have uh, printer manufacturers as customers, and they would talk about the challenges they undergo when prototyping. And if they don't carefully fire up their systems, they'll break the belts and knock the printer into little pieces the first time they do it. So there are some constraints on how you go about developing. It's not, it's not always benign. And certainly, I've looked at some pretty big, nasty embedded systems in my days, especially you know in aerospace and defense. Uh, in all those cases, anything, any machine you're hooking up is subject to you know, what that machine can do. <laughs> Certainly a, a good metaphor is at the, um, the desktop toy level, you know, there are USB toy missile launchers. 
<laughs> take take that paradigm and extrapolate it as far as you want, as far as what the risks might be. But certainly, you know, burning out motors or tearing equipment apart if it's more than a single sensor or relatively trivial application is important. So someone in the chain of development has to understand the physical constraints, has to be an electrical engineer or a mechanical engineer. The beautiful thing, as, as Rob was describing, is there's now more and more standardized nodes where other people have taken care of a lot of that engineering for you. It sounds like that's, there's going to be some exciting opportunities for uh, QA testers as well. We've been talking a lot about nodes. And I hope that this brought you a great in in introduction to the Internet of Things.